<laughs> Hi everybody, welcome back to Big Science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like to to myself. Alright, so, um, we're looking at... So we're looking at price and pricing methods. So, firstly, what's price? Give me a definition of what price is in the first place. What's price? Thank you. How much is the living pay? Is it pricing plus the exact same thing? Did you really just ask that? I use my sarcastic tone because it was sarcasm. I was sarcastic, good, thank you. Get <laughs> worried. So, you bring up a good point. So, price and cost is not the same thing. Price is how much people are willing to pay for a product, cost is what? How much the business pays to make the product? Okay. So cost is how much the business pays to make the product. Price is how much the consumer is willing to pay. Not so much how much they do pay, but how much they're willing to pay. Because just because something is $100 doesn't mean you will pay $100 for it. If you're not willing to pay $100 for it, you're not going to buy it. And this is where we look at these different methods and strategies in terms of, well, what's the best way of figuring out what people are willing to pay. What's the number one way you can figure out what people are willing to pay for a product? Market research, which tells you people like the product like this or like that, and they're willing to pay X amount of dollars. Okay? And then they look at these strategies and they say, well, how can we now make it a bit more um, formal? Rather than just saying, oh, something between $50 and $100 is a good price for this product. They look at it and say, well, now what can we actually charge for it as an actual price? Okay? That this is a very fine balancing act for you. Okay? If it's too high, what might happen to the product if the, if the price is too high? It might not sell. People, so people won't buy it, which means that business loses money because no one's buying their product. Okay? Might lose existing customers. Might lose existing customers, thank you. What if it's too low? What if price is too low? Okay, so they might, sell, they might be selling for a loss. People might not see its value. They might not see its value. If it's too low, it might have that conception that it's cheap and nasty. It'll break after a couple of uses. And we've got cost base. What gets you about cost base? So they figure out if it costs us $3 to make one tennis racket, then they add a markup or a margin. They add a little bit more. So it costs them $3 to make it. They're just going to add an extra 10% or an extra 100% or an extra 1,000% on top of that. All right, what's market-based pricing? How's it determined? This one's literally going to have three words there. Um, what are they? And one of them is and. So there's going to be two more words. Thank you. Yeah, so basically what, what's happening here is it's based on what are people actually willing to pay for this product. So it's whatever the market is willing to pay. If people are prepared to pay $100 for an item, then let them pay $100 for the item. As you're saying, at least, but when you're a strict supply, so all of a sudden when you've got less of something, what happens to the price? It goes up. Because the less of something becomes more valuable because there's less. If everyone had a million dollars, would a million dollars be worth anything? No. No, because everyone's then got it. So that's the only reason money's got value, because not everyone's got it. So if we restrict items, so all of a sudden there's less red t-shirts in the economy, the price goes up, because there's less of them around. They're a bit more valuable, a bit more limited, a bit more rare. Okay? If all of a sudden there's so much of it, prices go down, because well, if everyone's going to end up with you know, a million dollars anyway, if everyone's going to end up with a t-shirt, if everyone's going to end up with a pen, if everyone's going to end up with whatever, then they're worthless, because if everyone's got it, why would you pay a lot of money for it if, you, if everyone's already got access to it anyway? Okay? So, that's one way they can, also another way they can uh, determine their pricing. And then you've got competition-based. Um, so, what's competition-based pricing? What's that about? Someone give me a definition. What's competition-based pricing? Okay. 
Um, competition base. So you're setting a price either below, equal, or above competitors. Why? Well, for, also, they've got to make sure that they've covered their costs. So if, they, if they're going to set their price below competitors, but they're making a loss, then they might need to rethink their strategy because it doesn't matter if you're going to, you know, compete with, you know, Virgin wants to compete with Qantas. If they're setting their price below their competitor, but they're losing money, then is it worth it? Probably not. So they need to rethink. So once, they cut, once their costs are covered, then they work out, well, what's everyone else doing? So if they set their price below a competitor, what might happen? Or why? Is that? It could cause a price war. Good. So one competitor is a bit lower, then the next one goes down, the next one goes down, to the point where they then don't make any profit at all because they've reduced their margins so much. Thank you. Okay. What else? Or why would you use a below? A below competition market price strategy. What would you use that? To get into a new market. So there's a new market and you want to get into the market. So what do you do? You sort of undercut your competitors. Okay, Virgin comes in. They want to, you know, Qantas has already got a really well-established, um, a really well-established presence in Australia. So what's one way you can get market share really quickly? Undercut competitors. Okay, if you set it. At equal competitive price, what might that do? Or why? Or why would you do that? Why would you set the same price as competitors? What's the reasons why I might do it? Yeah? I think you intentionally set it to avoid having to um, conduct market research concerning what consumers are willing to pay. Well, exactly. That's one of the reasons they do it. Why waste money asking people what price they're willing to pay? If they're already paying $20 for that, you might as well just charge $20 as well because you know they're going to pay it already anyway. So why waste money and time doing market research when you can already sort of, you know, leech off someone else's market research that they've done? Okay? What if you set it above your competitors? Um, just to make it more exclusive. To make it seem as being more superior or luxurious or exclusive, yeah. Alright, um, very first one. This is one of my favourites, mainly because I love the analogy that comes with it. So with this one here, and I'll draw the diagram in a second. Alright, so with this one here, um, businesses charge the highest price possible that people are willing to pay during the introduction phase. And it plays on the novelty of the item. If it's something regular, if it's something that everyone's already aware of, if it's this table, for example, you're not going to pay a lot of money for it because, well, if you just get a table, it's a table. It's four legs and a top, that's it. But something like, for example, I don't know, a self-driving car, that's something that no one's really seen before. You want to pay a lot of money for it to be the first person to own one because no one else is going to have it. Okay, or a smartwatch, for example, when they first came out, pay the highest amount possible because no one else can pay for it. Okay, the novelty of it. Okay, now as I've always shown the um, the example of the diagram, imagine a you know a vat, a barrel. Okay, a barrel of monkeys of, of, of beef and a barrel of milk, cream. Okay. You've heard the cliche, you know, the cream rises to the top. The cream is the best part. That's got the fat, it's got the protein, it's got the calcium, it's got the sugars. That's the best, the cream is the best part of the milk. That's where the most nutrients are. Okay, so what happens, and this is the best that I can think of. So you've got, let's say the cream is at the highest point there, and that's, for example, a car that's at $100,000. Okay? For the novelty factor, it's got self-driving ability, it self-parks, or I don't know, whatever it does. Okay? So what happens is, again, they're skimming the top. Okay? Like you skim the top of the cream off that milk to get the best parts. You skim the best customers. So they basically imagine... Do you remember school? Okay, imagine they're skimming that top part of the cream. Once you've basically used up... Once you've basically used up those best customers... There's no one left willing to pay $100,000 for a self-driving car. You lower the price, and you might bring it down to $80,000. Okay, you bring it down to $80,000. 
And then you skim those next customers who are willing to pay $80,000 for that novelty of that item. One, and this could take months, could take years. It doesn't have to happen day by day. But then, for example, you're out of people who are willing to pay 80 grand for a car that drives itself because now there's others that are coming onto the market. So, you know, Tesla's got theirs. Maybe one day, I don't know, Ford or Holden or, you know, Fiat or whatever it is, they might come up with their own car. So then they can then charge the higher price because their car is now the novelty item because you might have something different to it. Still self-driving, but it's also self-driving and self-parking. Not just one. So they can then charge a higher price. Poor old Tesla only has the self-driving model. So in order to still keep sales, then they bring it down a bit more. And they say, okay, well, $80,000, we've exhausted all those people who are willing to pay any grand. Let's now bring our car down to 60 instead and see if we can now skim the top part of that, you know, of the cream, the best part. Skim the top part of those customers that are willing to pay that amount of money. All right. Um, price penetration. It's from the water. Okay, price penetration. So with this one here, they charge the lowest price possible. They charge the lowest price possible in order to gain quick market share. You're a brand new company, what's the best way to get as many customers as possible? Charge a low price. Don't charge $100 for a t-shirt like, you know, one brand does. Charge 50 Charge 50 instead. So you start to basically get a quick amount of market share. The problem with this though is, it's going to be really hard to then re increase your prices a lot. Because if you start selling your shirts for $50, and then after a week you go, now they're all 60, it's going to look a bit dodgy for the company as well, but com uh, customers might then think, well, if you're going to be just as expensive as competitors, I'll just go to people already know, rather than staying with you. So this is going to be done very carefully. Okay, you can't charge such a low price that then you sort of back yourself into a corner and then can't get out of it if you want to increase your prices a little bit over the next few years. Because then people will sort of start to go back to competitors instead. Okay? Um, then we've got, I'm just going to go across here, we've got lost leaders. Alright, so with lost leaders, with lost leaders, they sell their products at or below cost price. So the cost for them to make it. So if they, you know, it costs them, let's say, $1 to make it, they'll sell it for $8 or below. Okay? The aim is, when you're there, and you think, well, when you're spending a dollar for this, hey, I'll also get that as well. So the aim is that they're going to recoup their money. I don't even know if I've spelled that properly. I don't even know if that's a real word. But they're going to recoup their money they're going to recoup the money from selling other items. You go to Coles or Woolies, and they've got Tim Tams, maybe, maybe, on the end of the shelf. And let's say it costs Arnott's, I don't know, $4 to make them at a packet. They're going to sell them for $2. They're losing money on them. But the idea is you go buy the packet of Tim Tams for below cost price. You then also say, hey, I'm going to get a bottle of milk as well, because you know what goes good with the box of Tim Tams? A glass, a cup of tea, or a glass of milk. So the idea is, the idea is, they're losing money on one product, but they're losing money on one product, but they're going to hopefully regain that lost profit by selling you something else. But they've drawn you in. The idea is they've drawn you in. All right, last one, last one, last one. Price points. All right, so selling products at a. Um, three different prices. Regardless, regardless, shh, shh, guys, this is the last one. Selling products at a predetermined price, regardless of how much they cost, regardless of how much they cost. So there's no fixed markup. So there's no one item and then plus 100 percent, another item plus 200 percent. There's no fixed markup. It makes it easier for the customer to find what they want because they can just literally go on this range or this range or this range. And jewelers do it as well. Jewelry stores do it. Okay, or watchmakers. You go to a jewelry store or a watchmaker and they've got the basic model, they're all $50 regardless of the type they are. The next level up is $70 and the next level up is $80. So you know, any, any watch in this shelf is going to be one price regardless of how much it costs that jeweler to buy. 
The next one is going to be this price, regardless of how much you cost them to buy. The next one's going to be this much, regardless of the features or how much you cost them to buy.